How do we escape it? Well, we go to the pharmaceutical man, the drug man, and he gives us stuff, fills us full of a bunch of drugs and all that, and pretty soon tomorrow comes, the next day, next month, and, and I still got the same darn problem. I'm going to mask over the problem instead of fix the problem or cure the problem. And all of it, Jesus Christ is saying, come, turn from that and come to me and I will heal you. The reason you don't have no health care, the reason you got so many people who see mass murder as an option is because you're being punished. You can't see the, the, the value behind loving your enemy, blessing those who seek to persecute or curse you, blessing them. Instead, we ignore them, and we seek a way to justify in our own heart, a way to capitalize on their pains and sufferings. They get angry, mad, and, and explosive when we do that. And you say, where's the evidence of that? Jesus says, those who hate me have a destiny of coals and sulfur in a hot, scorching wind. Those who love violence, those who love violence, those who love to capitalize on the pains and sufferings of other people, Loving violence, loving the destruction, the destroying, the war, the battle, had nothing to do with the preservation of life, especially the life of, of these I love. Now, David, if we go to another story, same type thing, we got uh, David and... Uh, Chapters 30, uh, a group of people come and, and they capture his wives and people are raiding into Judah. Saul is still king. Saul ha has his army and that and their army is doing whatever. And this is right at the time when Saul and his band were finally destroyed. David has his little army and that and they're kind of out doing things for justice, right? They raid the towns and that, take a couple of his wives and all their stuff, and now these raiders are off, and David gathers up 600 men, valiant warriors, you know, and we're going to go get them, go get my wives back, and all our stuff that they came and plundered, right, and so they're heading out, and they're seeking for these guys, and pretty soon everybody's getting real tired and exhausted, and, oh, he can't go no further. Too tired, too exhausted. Right? And, and so David says, All right, well, anybody who's too tired or too exhausted to make the journey across the valley to go on and take down these raiders, you, you guys stay right here and rest. Just, just stay right here and rest. And, and then David takes 400 men and himself, goes out, and, and they kill the, the plundering army and the enemy and the Amalekites and, and all that, you know. And, Take everything back. They got everything. All the women and uh, all the flocks and food, gold, silver, anything and everything that was taken. Everything was there. It was there. It was there and it was available to them. All right? They had everything. Everything they needed. Everything that was stolen. Everything that was broken. Everything that was taken from them. It was all right there in fine order. David grabs it and, let's go, we're heading back. Gets back to where the 200 men are and tells the other 400, now let's start dividing it up between all 600. Now those other guys are like, what? What? We, we bore the work and the heat of the battle all this time. We were out there fighting in the battle, you know, like Jesus. Come work in my vineyard. And those who came at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, they bared the heat of the whole day. And those who were hired, you know, at the last hour, at the last minute, they didn't have to bear any work, yet they got the same reward. So here's these guys are out there fighting and battling, and they come, and we haven't even seen these guys. Where did they even come from? <laughs> and you're going to 
give them and divide them an equal amount of the plunder as you would us. And David says, of course. Of course, because isn't it rightfully so? We were all together. We all came. And it was the Lord who gave those enemies into our hands. And shouldn't we divide it up with, with these men who are our brothers and sisters? And not only did he do that, when he got back to Israel or Jerusalem, he divided it up amongst the elders of all the tribes. So everybody got some. Everybody got a piece. Everyone. Here, they have there in their time, you know, a person laid out on the ground being robbed and beaten and left of everything, and the priest is there, and then a Pharisee comes by. Oh, it's a person who is completely well listened to the Bible. I know all the Bible and all the laws of Moses and everything it says. I study the Word of God. And not only do I study the Word of God, I enforce the Word of God. Right? I enforce it. Paul said, for zeal. I was a Pharisee and I went out and I beat people down to, to get them to conform to God's Word. If you were acting bad, you were dragged out to a place of public shame. Right? They beat you in the middle of the streets. And so... We, we come to see that, that this is about uh, basic human rights. But we keep come to see that it's about Jesus Christ. And our love for Him, right? Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Right? And God says, well, there's only one way to love me. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then I'll know he loved me. So the Pharisee says, I know God. The priest who says, I know God. Both, they, they walk around. The lawgivers, right? There's government, the United States. How many congressmen and people say, I know God, I'm a Christian. Yet don't believe in the teachings of Jesus. Don't practice them. Right? Walks around. That, that poor man who's been beaten and left for dead. Jesus says, now, now here, here, here's the one who has life. Here's the light of the world. A Samaritan comes. This man at that time was like their enemy. Hated Samaritan. We've got Elijah living in Samaria. Or Samaria. And he, he goes and binds the man up. Right? Puts his own cloak on him, his own clothes on him. Binds up his wounds. Puts oil, medicine on his wounds. Takes him to the innkeeper. Today we call it a hospital. Takes him to the innkeeper, the motel. Right? And says, well, whatever it costs for this man to get well, if it takes a few more days, I'll pay for that too. I will return and take care of all the costs. Don't charge this man a dollar. We're not going to capitalize. I'm not here to capitalize on the pains and sufferings of another person. Oh, no, that was the teachings of the book of John. I was reading Matthew, sorry. In the book of John, it says, When you see somebody down, beat down and left for dead and the robbers, you, you go over and you say, psst, psst, Hey, bud, I could sure help you. I could get you out of that bad spot. For the low, low price of $500 an hour. Oh, you don't have the money? You don't have the money? You don't have... <laughs> Start walking to the other side of the road. Oh, no, that's not in the gospel. That's not in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Love your neighbor as you would yourself. Wow! What if I was the one who was beat down and left for dead by the robbers? What would I want most? I, I would want a, a friend. I, I, would, I would want a friend who was willing to love me in the same way I, I wish to be loved. 
And when that man received that help, that care, right? What what did he see, receive? He received deliverance. He received a healing. He was released from the bondages of sin. Those who are bound by sin look the other way. Those who are bound by sin beat down those who are weak. It says that the devil, wicked men, are like roaring lions seeking those whom they may devour. Capitalizing on the weak. And the poor, right? I'm sick. They even come up with the idea to make you feel like if you got sick, you're a criminal. Because only drug addicts are criminals. They're not sick. They're criminals. And we're gonna we're gonna start a war on those people. And how are we gonna create this war? on these sick uh, drug addict criminals all right we're, we're gonna we're gonna give them a pharmaceutical uh, drug dealer <laughs> this is how we're gonna tackle that war we're gonna kill them kill them we're gonna drug them to death I'm not gonna fix you I'm not gonna cure you but I'll rob you of everything you got even your dignity. So I ask this question. Which of these two things is easier to do? Which of these two things creates or takes more courage? Because in the book of Revelations it says that there are no cowards in heaven. Which of these things takes more courage? All right, and, and all this story. All right, we got Naaman, the leper. Okay, we, we got Gazi, we got the story of David, right? We, we, we got Jesus and his parable. Which of all these things, there's one thing that's common. Which of these things is easier to do? To go to your family members, the people you love, the people you trust, the people you care about, and you go to all your family and you say, Hey, look at all the things I've accumulated. Look at all my possessions and all the stuff I've accumulated. Look how God has blessed me. Which of these things is easier to do? Say to your family and friends, look at my success. All right? Or, or, does that take courage? How does it feel like when you've got your friends coming over to, when you're going to unveil to them your success? Are you, are you like full of courage? Or, 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 or is it when you, when you gather them all together, all your friends, all your family, and all your loved ones, and you say, look, I have lost everything, and now I need your help. Which of those things takes more courage? Because Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. A, 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 a great king, whose a father had two sons. Two sons. The first son says, Father, give me your inheritance, my inheritance, I want it now, my half of the estate, and everything that belongs to it. Now, and the father gives it to him, sells everything and now all the portion that belongs to him and divides it in half and gives his half to that son, and, and that son leaves his father's presence, goes out into a foreign country, and spends it wildly and ravishly, prostitutes and whores and drunkards and, and, and just wasting it away. And then a great famine comes into the land. A great famine. And, and, and then he had nothing. And the famine was so severe, so great, he himself began to starve. And he gets a job becoming a servant or a slave to one of them distant foreigners. 
and, and he's feeding the pigs. In the Jewish culture, and that way, there was, you couldn't get no lower feeding the swine. I became hungry, and, and he wished, oh boy, I wished I could just eat the swine's food. And even though he had a job, and he was doing these things still, no one had compassion on him. He didn't care if he was starving to death. He didn't care if he was rotting away in his own flesh. He didn't care if he became sick. They just didn't care about him. We're going to capitalize on your weakness. And, and, the, and, and the son finally comes to his senses. He begins to think with a sound mind. He says, I know. I, I will go back to my father's house. For even the servants have something. And if I was a slave to my father's servants, at least I'd have a little. At least I wouldn't be hungry. At least I'd have some refuge, shelter. And, and he stands up and begins to head home. Father, Sees him far away off, and joy and excitement grows in the father's heart, and he leaves. Where's Jesus? When is Jesus coming? And he leaves heaven, leaves his kingdom, and goes out and meets the son while he's still a far distance off. Right? And the son says to the father, Father, I've lost everything. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I've sinned against you in heaven and the earth. Right. And the father wraps his arms around the son. He's weeping with great joy and love. Screaming out and hollering back to the house, look, my, my son, my son. He was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. Kill the, the fattened calf. Let's have a great feast. Let's have a great party for, for my son was dead. But today is alive. So, so what are we doing in our world? The, that which is pleasing to God, participating in the, the destruction of our enemies, those we hate? Or are we participating in, in the preservation of that which we love the most? God says, I love my son the most. Who is my son? Right? The good Samaritan. The, the, when, 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 when I said, when I cried out from the wilderness and said, I've lost everything and now I need your help. Someone answered. Jesus Christ. Right? He's the, the answer, he's the way, he's the truth. And if Christ lives in me, here's the kicker, the Holy Spirit, blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. As Elijah says to Gazi, was not my heart with you, was not my spirit with you, was not my teachings with you. And, and, and yet you chose the things that displeased God. Right? Love your, your neighbor as yourself? The, the, if Christ lives in me, who, who's going to go and help that man? And, and he says, well, well, who in this story was the good neighbor? The Samaritan. You go do the same. Jesus Christ. What are we waiting for in this world 
to, to turn this world around. They're, this world is begging for a man or a woman or a group of people to, to believe in God. It is the will of God that all men and women have the right to equal health care without the penalty of guilt or shame, without being called a criminal, without being capital, capitalized upon help being taken advantage of. And then we look in our world and we, what's going on in our world today? Why do children walk into schools and, and blow their friends away? Why, why do people see violence and anger as the answer to the problems, the destruction of their enemies? Because no one believes in God. If you did, th th then turn from your evil ways and, and beg God for your forgiveness and He will be faithful to forgive you. Turn from those evil ways. If you can't do the things that displease God and not expect to be punished. I don't have health care because we use our own razor to divvy up the health care. And in all of it, all we're doing is, is saying to each other, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. You're not worthy. You're not worthy. I'm not worthy. It's like a man who's been forgiven a great amount of sin great amount of debt. And then that same man goes out and beats down everybody else. And they